is it going uh, beyond, right? Continue our look at practices of viewing this week, specifically with the theme of science. How does science present a certain way of, of looking at the world and ourselves? Um, and also looking back at it, of questioning that look, but also perhaps to, if for this, uh, this episode in particular, how can we take that scientific uh, practice of, of, of viewing and expand it into places that perhaps it, it didn't know was possible or it, or is maybe a little bit uh, afraid of, of looking and taking it that far? And so today's theme is we're looking at humanism, the idea of humanism, and we'll talk about what that philosophy is, how it's related to science, how it's related to art, um, and, and as, a, as a particular way of scientific looking. And then we're going to talk about post-humanism, which by the title is related to humanism, but takes that scientific look uh, further in an uncharted territory with some um, with some effects that f for you guys and for me, we are going to discuss um, the ethical and maybe even moral dilemmas that come out of it. And so without further ado, let's get started. Students will be able to answer and discuss the following questions. What are the key characteristics and concepts central to humanism? And how have artists incorporated these ideas in their representations? And the same, the same objective for post-humanism. -human, um, how, how is it going uh, beyond, right? Post typically means after, after humanism. What does that mean? How do they incorporate it in representations? We're gonna talk about how the arts is both similar and different um, those that incorporate humanist ideas and those that incorporate po post-humanist ideas. And then finally is that last dilemma that I was talking about. What are some of the ethical dilemmas that have existed in history for um, art works uh, that engage with humanist and post-humanist art? So really fun discussion. I hope you guys uh, enjoy. So first off the bat, let's talk about humanism. Some of you may have heard that term before or the humanities. So this is this this class, uh, which is an art history class, is part of the humanities. And so it is a grouping of uh, different disciplines that deal with the human condition. That's where we get human and ism. And humanism is a philosophy, a movement, uh, a way of structuring education that really came about during the 1400s and the 1600s during uh, that, that period of time in Europe is called the Renaissance, which was a rebirth, right? It was a rebirth. Um, and it was also a cultural movement, a vast cultural movement that affected all aspects of society medicine, architecture, governing, all aspects of society. And why was it such a big movement and why was humanism so important to it? Well, it was a turn away from medieval scholarship. So before the, thir the before the 1400s, so you know, that's the the time of the Middle Ages. Um, and there was this belief that, you know, the medieval ideas about the world about about science, about medicine, was not as good as it could be, right? There was a sense that the, there, it, there was this reliance on superstition, um, too much on kind of unfounded beliefs um, that may or may not actually be part of how, say, the human body or the environment actually works. So there was this interest in a very scientific empirical look uh, an understanding of the world around us and us humans that live in it. And where did where do we find um, precedent for those types of uh, of inspections of the world? Well, in ancient Greek and Roman thought, which is something that Greek philosophers and Roman philosophers had been talking about since antiquity. And so the Renaissance as a rebirth, was a rebirth of a of Greek and Roman interest 
in the in, in that empirical rational thinking about the world that in introspection and um and the humanism is is one of those practices that came about in in this um, cultural movement and so what is humanism it's an outlaw an outlook or system of thought that it, it, that that's prime it's it, it's prime the primacy is the importance to to human rather than divine or super supernatural matters so this goes specifically to it as an affront to medieval mindset right which was very much governed by religion and folklore and supernatural phenomena that were unexplained well no it's about how humans experience the world, right? How do we live in this world? How how do our, our bodies work versus these these very unexplained things? We want to explain things that we see and we feel. And so, humanist be beliefs stressed um, the potential value and goodness of human beings, um, emphasizes common human needs, and seeks solely rational ways of solving human problems. So in a, in, a, in a world before the Renaissance where it was a very outward, very, um, you know, omn omniscient view, right? That there are forces out there uh, that were out of our control as humans. Well, humanism is very, making it a little bit more self-centered to, and on the human scale, right? That we can understand things because we are going to rationally solve our problems we're going to see ourselves as p potentially good and what we do is is trying to benefit the world around us and that we all have common human needs say like something like disease we all experience it and we all should have ways of overcoming it and so there was an emphasis on the scientific process right and we we, all, we know the scientific process we've learned this in school um, and a scientist in, in the humanist belief must ignore any previously held beliefs of the subject being studied, right? So a scientist, when it's looking at something, right, say I'm trying to figure out the life cycle of a frog or this particular frog that's in front of me, um, I have to, if, I might be afraid of frogs. I might have, there might be a superstition about a frog that I know about that makes me fearful of the frog but I need to let those go because I am looking at something very objectively and empirically and I need to, it, it, is, it, it, it is a microcosm, right? I need to take my, my emotions and my thoughts out of it. Um, and so it's all about the how the scientist is then testing their subject, right? Um, how they, they have to be very intuitive, right? You have to have a lot of knowledge in humanism. You have to know a lot about everything, right? If we're thinking about medicine, you need to understand symptoms. You need to understand reactions to things so that you can very much pinpoint your, like what's going on with your subject, right? Oh, you're, you're complaining of this ailment. Well, I have studied this ailment and it, it, this is usually the cause and this is usually something that helps, right? And so that's why in humanism, the human body becomes so important, right? It is only through looking and seeing firsthand the intricate composition of, say, tissues, nerve cells, brain, brains, brain, uh, brain connections to nerves, skeletons, blood circulatory systems. The, you, the having an intricate knowledge of this is, is how you understand the body, but also outside of it, how you can also understand the world. If you can understand the minutia of how things interconnect, you can problem solve and solve it very efficiently and very objectively. And so when we're thinking about humanism in art, the the human body as both a microcosm and macrocosm of on the, of this idea of figuring out things empirically um, had a lot to do the, the image of the human body became a powerful canvas for these views and so in this first image which i think is a really fun one to talk about um, is what was humanism trying to get away from in in terms of seeing the human body as um, a microcosm for the, the the micro scale and the macro scale. Well, that was medieval thinking, 
the, the something from the 1300s. And this is a wonderful illuminated manuscript. So a hand painted book made from typically lambskin. That's what the, the pages were made from. And it was made by Nicholas of Lynn, and it's called The Zodiac Man. And it was a very cutting edge for the 1300s view of anatomy, of human anatomy. And so we have, you know, a traditional anatomical look. You have to have a, a, a body, a human body being rendered, typically um, a nude, blatantly nude, or assumed implied nudity, which I think we have here. And typically with anatomy and anatomical drawings, you have systems then being um, shown on, on this body. You're showcasing something. So this Zodiac man is showcasing that during this time, there was a belief that certain regions, right, very vague in general, certain regions of the body uh, were governed by astrological forces, celestial vo uh, forces, and um, and here in the form of the, the zodiac, right, the zodiac as, as these representations of constellations that have um, astrological um, connotations, right? And so here we see that the human body is a microcosm and macrocosm, that your certain regions of your body are associated with certain celestial outside macro events. And then we associate certain um, things to the zodiac signs. For example, um, you know, I, I'm a self-disclose. I am a Scorpio, and actually Scorpio season is coming up. My birthday is coming up soon. And that is a sign that is often a sign that is, is a constellation that is often associated with reproductive organs. And so in medieval anatomy, if you are having issues with your reproductive organs, then it they would say oh yes it's a problem with the you know the the scorpion and and so and and very general and not very accurate right um but still thinking about the body as some sort of conduit that if we learn something about the body we can learn something about the outward world but as you can see this is the type of thinking that the renaissance and humanism really wants to expand upon and make a little bit more accurate to you know what actually lays underneath our body right um what are the mi these micro systems that we can pick apart and see and really understand and not rely so much on these kind of belief systems right the belief in these zodiac um associations and these celestial events and so here is the alternative to the medieval zodiac man given by the Renaissance man, the epitome of the Renaissance van, a man, Leonardo da Vinci, who, this is a great example of humanism, right? What is humanism doing to that same idea? It is looking at, ex with extreme empirical detail, every single system within the, the, the human body and really trying to understand how it works. And in the same way, if we can understand, say, the um, the uh, the system, nerve systems of a body, or here, which I love this one, how does you know human reproduction actually work? You know, in a womb, and figuring that out has so much ramific has great ramifications for actually saving lives, um, finding medicines and treatments that actually can pinpoint and target and work um, on those very specific parts of the human body and its particular network within our body. And so we see the, the, the anatomy much more looking at the organic human body as a kind of biological machine, right? We have parts that, can, that function much like mechanisms and Leonardo da Vinci actually invented a type of water pump that was tr was using the same mechanism of the heart pumping water uh not water but blood through through the body and so excruciating detail 
And he was able to, this was a bit of, uh, I mean, this was still controversial during um, the time that he was making it because there was a taboo against uh, autopsies and, and, and actually, um, you know, having a cadaver and, and doing an autopsy and actually, cause that's the only way you're really going to do this work is actually working with bodies and uh, opening them up and peeking under the hood, so to, so to speak, and actually see which, but it was a taboo. Um, and Leonardo da Vinci was gave a, gave, was given a, you know, a pass at this because of his notoriety because of the Renaissance and the belief that this is something that was valued to do. And also Leonardo kind of spun it a little bit um, in a world that was still very much governed by the church and specifically Roman Catholicism. And um, he said, well, this very scientific inspection of the body will actually give me scientific discovery of the soul that I can actually say something as spiritual as a soul, the idea of a soul, I can actually find exactly where it is. Perhaps the soul is actually, say, an organ or a, a part of the body that I can find. And so he was able to do this work because of um, him kind of spinning and um, this religious uh, atmosphere, but also very much putting that religious thought into this scientific context. And this interest in anatomy will continue to go for, forward in different ways. Um, so if we think about da Vinci, it's, it was very much about education and knowledge and knowing and doing something with this, this knowledge. Well, artists later on took that knowledge to better understand how to represent the human body, right? Um, that if you understand anatomy, then you understand how to render the flesh that covers the anatomy and the, the space that surrounds the anatomy in a much more uh, natural way. And here we have two examples of, of, of famous uh, anatomy lessons. Um, we have um, To Our Right by um, Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp from 1632. Um, and then on our left, we have Thomas Eakins, The Gross Clinic from 1875. And you can see just by the difference between the two, right, that we, the, this development and this interest in understanding how the, the micro, the, the anatomy can help us figure out how to render bodies and render space is developing, you know, in between 200 years. So we have this, it's a, you know, this is a depiction uh, of space and bodies that see, that is very, you know, natural, but it seems still very stylized. Look at these guys just kind of piled up on top of each other. We don't get a really clear sense of depth, right? This is in, kind of inaccurate. Like what perspective are we looking at? Like, are you on stools? What's going on? Maybe you are on stools, but it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. Um, the way that this, the, the actual um, cadaver is laying is really there for us to see the anatomy happen, but it, it in and of itself is kind of also kind of foreshortened. It's, it's a little odd in this space. But then when we get to Eakins, who is an artist who was very interested in realism of, of, of accurately and truthfully rendering the subject matter, and so that means he's paying close attention to that perspective and what we see and don't see. And so we have another cadaver here that's being, you know, kind of worked on in, in this lesson. Like this is a this is a medical school, right? Um, that we don't see everything from all vantage points. And notice we have people craning their neck craning their necks to see, right? Because you won't be able to see everything unless you're right on top. And then we also have, I love this element, the uh the, the, the recorder of, of this session, um, a woman who is, can't watch because she, she's totally um, grossed out the gro um, of this entire scene. And here we have blood on the hands of the instructor, which we don't have over here, right? Um, but we see that interest in the human as the epicenter, right? Of, of seeing, of, of that practice of viewing 
um, is, is, is from here to he, from Leonardo da Vinci, right? Very internal to let's see how how that that will shape how the these bodies are rendered and then space and then here much more realistic 